So I started going to church for the first time in my life in December, and a month later, he came that January. And I remember noticing him, but everyone remembers that day. Like everyone that still goes to our church that was there that day remembers you coming in to church because he's tall, he's tatted, he's vulnerable, and he's praising the Lord, hands raised. The next Sunday you introduced yourself to me. The next Sunday after that, you introduced yourself to me again. I was like, yes, I know, you're Shay. <laughs> there would be things that I would say in Bible study that nobody would get, and she would be translating them mm. to, to the people in the Bible study, because I'm coming in off the street. And she would hear me talk, and then they'd be like, huh? And then she'd explain, and they'd be like, oh. And I'd say, within two months in. Two months in, we she were She was already like, making wedding decorations. We're like, that's lies. That's lies. It was 10 months in. <laughs> Well, Michelle, Shay, thank you so much for coming back on the channel. Um, the last time people guys saw you was individually, uh, so people may not know that you are married. And to get, today we get the honor to uh, receive your marital testimony. Now, for people who don't know you or maybe who have not seen you before, uh, could you just introduce yourself very briefly to those who are watching, Absolutely. starting with Shay? Hi, I'm Shay Watson, uh, married to this beautiful lady. Uh, we have a beautiful family together, and we just enjoy rolling ministry together, enjoy rolling life together. And we have our struggles, but hey, don't yeah. we all? But yeah. I love being with this woman. Yeah, I'm Michelle Watson. I'm the other half. And yeah, we live in the DMV area, and it's been a blessing to like have met in church and you know, falling in love at church and, and all of that stuff. And so now we roll in ministry and podcasting and all the other stuff together, have a daughter, have some chickens, you know, living the life, <laughs> whatever life it is, but it's for the glory of God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. How long have you guys been married now? We've been married six and a half years. Six and a half years. Tell us about how you came together. How did the Lord bring you together? We've seen your individual testimonies. And for people who have not seen it, if you're watching right now, you can go in the description box and click on the individual links for their testimonies to be able to watch it on your own time. Um, but in short, how did God bring you guys together? Church. Yeah, it was church. I think we mentioned it in some way in both of our testimonies, but it was a month. So I started going to church for the first time in my life in December, and a month later, he came that January. And so it was literally four Sundays apart, and I remember noticing him, but everyone remembers that day. Like Everyone that still goes to our church that was there that day remembers you coming in mm. to church because he's tall, he's tatted, he's vulnerable, and he's praising the Lord, hands raised, dealing with whatever he was dealing with. We did not know what he was dealing with. And I remember asking a friend whose husband had met him. I was like, hey, so what's the new guy's name? Because it was the first new person right. since me. We weren't getting new people every week like we do now. And so um, she didn't know your name. <laughs> They, they didn't talk during service, right. which is a good thing. But, um, but yeah, the next Sunday you introduced yourself to me. The next Sunday after that, you introduced yourself to me again. I was like, yes, I know, you're Shay. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, and so from then, there was only one Bible study in our church, and you started coming. I feel like that's where we grew. I that's feel like where, that's where yeah. we started formulating a, a relation because we started to understand that we understood each other. Right. There would be things that I would say in Bible study that nobody would get, and she would be translating them mm. to, to the people in the Bible study because I'm coming in off the street, and, and she's <laughs> and she's coming in new, but she's got you know college and the and the and all. That's the, not and, what did. Well, but also also the understanding though, like, and she would right. hear me talk, and then they'd be like, "Huh?" And then she explained, they'd be like, "Oh." Yeah. That's what he's trying to say. And so we yeah. learned that we could communicate well together yeah. and that we could actually be geared to one another and right. actually help one another in how we move and navigate life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we started moving towards one another. Yeah. Yeah. And through that, we started to build the relationship. Yeah, I think there was a lot of vulnerability in both of us. Like we both don't really hold back. We just share it no matter what it makes you think of me individually. I'm going to tell you what God's delivered me from. And... You did the same. Oh my gosh. And so it's not that everyone else in our Bible study at that time didn't have their own struggles. Everyone does. Everyone has their own story. But both of us, one thing we had in common is we just would share our story, even if it was an embarrassing part or a <gasps> part or something, you know, if it was taboo or whatever, that's what we'd share because we, we were fresh off the streets trying to figure out this Jesus life. So I didn't balk 
I found it refreshing when you would share yeah. stuff because even though you did more than I did, right? You dabbled in more stuff than I did in certain ways on the heart level, in the roots, we were dealing with the exact same stuff. And so it felt like, oh, someone who gets me. And right. and so we, we definitely bonded and started connecting during Bible studies. Mm. Now, without without telling your full testimony, because obviously people can watch that, but just for context, um, and Michelle, we'll start with you. Uh, but can you just give us an insight as to uh, what your life before Jesus uh, looked like and what you were coming in with uh, into the church? Mm -hmm. My life was like a whitewashed tomb. Like it was super dark and it was decorated real pretty to distract everyone because I really desperately didn't want anyone to realize how broken and sad and lonely and depressed I felt because I was sure that if someone saw that, they wouldn't want anything to do with me, friendship or otherwise. And so that was who I was, just broken on the inside, trying to use everything I could to fix it. But I was trying to reach for you know success, my own definitions of what that meant. So rather than reaching down into, um, you know, people do it different, but some people they reach down to drugs or down to a lot of things that the world says, you know, that's not healthy. But I was reaching for all the healthy stuff, you know, the money, the degrees, the accolades, the jobs, you know, whatever, and none of it was good enough, right? And I didn't feel good enough. When I came to the Lord alone on my couch, reading the book of Revelation of all books, because I saw His grace in that book, He keeps giving humanity and us as individuals chance after chance after chance. Right. And so that's why that book to me was the book that woke me up to His love. And because it was an annotated version I was reading, it explained what Jesus' role in our salvation is, that He is our salvation. So I came to that. And so once I was saved, I instantly felt this weight lift off. Like I had hope. I could I could be with him for eternity and it wasn't all up to me. And I didn't have to be my own God and I didn't have to be in control of my own life to that degree. Mm. There were things outside of my control and suddenly that wasn't terrifying because there was a good God in charge of those things. And so that's when a month later I decided to start going to church. And that's the church that I am at right now with you. Mm. Shame. Lost, broken, heavy, out of control. That was my life. I came to church in a little different manner. Uh, again, I experienced a loss. And that loss drove me into church, and it was more of a, hey, God, fine. Everyone's been praying, telling me I need to go to church. So here I am. Here I am. What are you going to do? But then like it's like that first Sunday, here I am. Everyone knows it. And I'm in the front row, hands raised, crying because I'm lost, and I'm looking for something. Did I know that Jesus was that thing at the moment? Not really. But within two months, because of some other things that, that transpired in those two months, I was on my knees begging for God. It was like God, I, I just opened up. It was like, here I am. Okay, here I am. And I think that that's important in our lives. I think that when we come to that point of, of just the end, and it's like, I have nowhere else to go. And here I am. I'm standing here. Here I am. I, I love that. Here I am. Mm -hmm. Here I am. And, and there I was. And you know what? He didn't disappoint. He showed me right there on the spot through some healing and, and through some other amazing miracles in my life that He was real and that He was there for me. Mm -hmm. And from there, it was just, let's go. And, and, and I've been go since. So nine, nine and a half years, almost 10 years, I've, I've been going. So much go. <laughs> so much go. Sometimes she's like, uh, slow. maybe it's just slow. <laughs> and I'm like, we can still go. <laughs> Beautiful. So now you guys find yourself in the same church. Um, the Lord is touching you individually. Now, did this happen quickly um, as far as you guys coming together and getting married? Tell us about that process. Was this something that it was like, okay, this is the person for me. She gets me. He gets me. Let's get married. Or did it take some time? What did that look like for you guys? Let's we'll start with Shay. So if you watch my testimony, you'll learn that I was married before. And that's really what drove me to God. So there was some... some Things that had to be taken care of first. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't something that was in the front of my mind. Uh, relationship wasn't necessarily in the front of my mind. I was like, I need to know who Jesus is. I need to, I, there, there has to be a focus right now. So there was a, a longevity of our walk. Um, we, we dated for a year, we were engaged for a year. But during those times, there was never any hesitation to, are we going to be married? It wasn't a matter of like, will we ever, you know, because we were in this to win it. It was like, if we're going to date, 
we're getting married. It was just a time thing. And I needed to, to heal and become closer to Christ. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's funny because I was trying to fill this hole in my heart with a man for so long, and I couldn't get one, right? Everything, like, it always messed up. It always failed. I always dropped the ball, or they dropped the ball, or whatever. It, it never worked out. And so I was trying to find, you know, I did some online dating, and I was still social, and I worked in a place that had tons of people, so it was easy to meet people and all of that. So what's funny is I was literally going to church, and that was the place I was not looking for a guy, because I was like, this is where I'm going to go find Jesus. I didn't realize I could find him any day, every day in his word and et cetera. Like at that time I was like, church is where I'm gonna go find the Lord mm. and understand more about him and I'm not gonna get distracted there with some guy. And then of course that's where the guy shows up. But it wasn't, I mean, I did notice him, but I also quickly after that, it's funny, he disappeared for a month, but it was for work. And I didn't know he disappeared for a month for work. And I was so heartbroken, but not because I liked him, but because for some reason, my heart had just mm. extended out to this guy. This is before he ever went to Bible study. My heart just extended out to this this guy who who came to church alone, who looked so wrecked. And I and I know what it's like to be lonely and depressed and scared and alone. And so he was the first person, and it's happened a few times since, where it's like my heart adopts a person as like my prayer project. But I didn't know where he was, but I was praying like, Lord, wherever he is, please don't let him just be without you wherever he is. Hmm. Now, little did I know he's in Kenya doing work, <laughs> right? He's he's not like out on the streets without Jesus, but like you know, gave you know it up. What's cool though is you were praying for me in a season that you needed that prayer. I needed prayer because I had fallen back into to to, to drugs and <laughs> right. I'll just I'll just throw it out there. No, yeah. Yeah. And so I'm over in Kenya, and I haven't done drugs in decades. I, I, that's whole what broke up my marriage. So I didn't want to go back. Here I'm doing drugs. Yeah. And then here she is praying for me in a time of need, hmm. and God is working the whole time. Right. Like, it's it's amazing. That was when I fell on the, my knees. And yeah. so then hearing these stories and knowing that later on, it's like, wow, there, there were people there for me. It's almost like Christ puts people into your lives yeah. to, to build you up and to edify you and to actually remind you that there are good. There is good, mm -hmm. and good comes through Him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so to hear this even now, it's like, it hits me emotionally. It's like, man, you know, we didn't even talk. It wasn't like in that first month we were sitting he said, there. Hi, like, my name is Shane I said, Hi, twice. my name is Shane. That's and all. The we time, had. You know, with her smart. Uh, yeah, you told me that last week. I'm like, oh. <laughs> But because you know, you know, I didn't know too. you had a traumatic brain injury. And, you know, I didn't know. <laughs> but but it's like it's cool to know, like even hearing it now that you know someone loved you or at least was put on your heart by Christ to pray for you. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's amazing. Yeah, I felt so invested in his future with Jesus during that time. It was weird, but it's like in my head, everyone else at church had Jesus because I, I was new. I didn't know that like people show up and they don't even know him yet. Like I thought you come when you have Jesus, right? And I didn't understand all the different ways people show up. So he was the first one to show up after me. And I felt like he was the all alone person that needed all the prayer, right? And so I was just praying almost every night for him saying, Lord, please, mm. even if our church isn't the one for him, please let him plug into one and have community and learn about you. I was praying, praying, praying. And then what's funny is four weeks later, he comes back and I'm like, oh, praise you, Lord, he's back <laughs> in church. I didn't know any of that, right? And it's a mind blowing even now because I've never actually thought about like what was going on. I know right. what went on, right. but it never pieced together that I'm praying for you during that. Until just now, I got a covering of prayer. Right, you had a covering of prayer, and it wasn't just your your mom. For someone I didn't even know, <laughs> you know. Um, and so when he came back, then he started coming to Bible study, and that's when I actually got to hear him speak and hear what he had been through. And so then he was clearly off limits at that point. And at that point, I just knew I was trying to build community in church. And so the next funny thing that happened is I was trying to build community in a church that didn't have a lot of singles, but there were some people who they had older kids, so they could, you know, go out without their kids. And so I was trying to just anyone I had connected with in church, trying to get them to go running with me, try to do 5Ks together, try to go grab a bite to eat together. And the vast majority of the time, the only person who would not flake or have a legitimate reason to not be there would be this guy. And mm. so we would awkwardly be hanging out solo, but at the same time, I still had on my heart, like, I knew his story. He had lost most of his friends, right, that were attached to the marriage and all that stuff. And I was like, well, he needs friends. Like, I still had all my work friends and college friends. They were, like, slowly losing things in common, like happy hours and stuff that I no longer really felt drawn to. But still, I, I had friends. So, but he don't have no friends that love Jesus. I'm not just going to be like, oh, you're a guy, so I'm not going to be here. I mean, like, now maybe it would be a whole different story this deep in my walk. But, like, for what it was then, 
we would go running together and have talks about whatever the heck we just read in the Word, and we barely understood it, but we were figuring it out together. And and then people started plugging in. We would do stuff and um, 5Ks and little groups and, and things like that. But through all of that, you know, you start to learn who this person is. If you know my story, I found out I had had herpes, and he's the one that I told, and he was like, oh, that sucks. Sorry about that, you know, and he took it very well. And so knowing all that stuff that's just sitting in the back of your mind, and then like a year goes by, you you accept, okay, there are feelings, you know, and and you're willing to try it out and see where it goes with the intention we're not going to waste time. If one of us realizes it wouldn't work out as a marriage, we're not even going to bother yeah. because, you know, for multiple reasons, it, we just felt like that was not a waste. And I say within two months in. Two months in, we She's were already like, making wedding decorations. We're like, no. that's lies. That's lies. It was 10 months in. <laughs> but still. But, yeah. but um, it was but it was like yeah. one of those plans. It was like, okay, yeah, we were, we're not gonna wasting time. So we're, we're just, this is our direction. And at any time we pull the plug, we pull the plug. But within a couple of months, it was like, mm. you know where you're going. Yeah. yeah. Was, was the age difference for you guys ever a thing that came up? Was it a problem? Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So that would be during one of our, our, our events where no one showed up. And here we are at a bacon fest. Bacon fest, y'all. Mm. <laughs> that's where we fell in love. No, just kidding. Not where fell we fell in love, love bacon. but fell in love bacon. <laughs> but that's where we got to know one another. And and it, it was so funny. She would be talking about college, and I'm talking about like these other Like things, life. Like life. Like and, adult life. And it, I looked over at Vince, and I'm like, wait, how old are you? You talk a lot about college. Yeah, you talk a lot about college. And, and I, I, I was 23 or 24. I think it was 23, 23, 23. and a half. I was 23 okay, and a half. 23 and a half. Uh, <laughs> which shows, yeah. But um, And Jay, how old were you at that time? Oh, Lord, 41, yeah. 42, 41, 42. And I mean, there. look at him. Like, he does not look his <laughs> age. And so I thought he was like mid-30s max. Like, probably early 30s, mid-30s. Like, I didn't really know. And then because of just how I am. I've always been like mother hen with my friends and stuff, asking everyone for happy hour. You got your keys? You got your keys? You're not drinking no more. You know, I was the mom. <laughs> and so he always, um, you used to think I was like in my late 20s. My late 20s. Yeah. And so then I keep talking about college. And so he's like, how old are you? And I'm like 23, expecting there to still be a, a difference in age, but not an 18 year difference in age, right? But it's like, it never felt foreign. And maybe one of the reasons is our parents are the same age. My parents had me in their early 40s. His parents had him in their 20s. Yeah. So we were raised by the same generation for whatever that adds to this. But It definitely know. makes it more comfortable when I talk to your mom. Yeah, it definitely doesn't make <laughs> it weird. Doesn't, I'm not talking to my I own I feel age. like <laughs> the, the outlier in my own family and his age-wise because I was the last the last cousin in my mom's line to be born. And, and the oldest the, oh. is 60 something, I believe. Right, and that's so the most confusing too. In. But that's like, most he was confusing. coming in expecting that all my cousins were my aunts and uncles. And he's <laughs> like, I'm like, no, they're cousins. Like think of it like your family age wise and you'll make, it'll all make sense. And so everything we've had in common, yeah. All of those things. It was very unlikely. It was cool. Our, I never our iPads expected. or no? What do we? What are those guys? The, the our iPod. The iPods. We still had iPods. iPods. We still had iPods back then. It was a few same years ago. Music. And same music. Same you genre. Know. Of course, that's all clean. Like different. <laughs> it's different now but, than what it was. Right. But it was like, wait, you got that? Wait, what? And so there's all of these things that even from our life, you know, outside of Christ, it was like they were so yeah. blended, and and we could talk to one another. We understood one another. She understood, you know, the older ideas of TV shows, and I understood the younger stuff, believe it or not. So it was cool. Yeah. It was good. Mm. You did ask about, like, what challenges get yeah. brought up, and I do think that sometimes it's it's the external stuff for us that challenges us the most, because in my opinion, you can lose your spouse any day of the week that you can say goodbye and then they get hit by a bus. And that's something you no one wants to dwell on, but you can lose your spouse, it doesn't matter the age difference. But then when someone brings up to you, well, you know, you have to start planning for what you're going to do when they die, because you're going to still be yeah. alive. I'm like, well, you're not wrong with the law of averages, but at the same time, none of us know the day and hour we're going to be called home. Right. And so, I shouldn't dwell in it any more than anybody else. Um, Store your money right and pray and trust in the Lord, and that's all you can do no matter what. You know, age gaps like that. And then someone warned you, like, like 
a gold like not a gold oh digger. no no it's past no, it was we past just say it. what it is we were in marriage I counseling remember. we're in marriage counseling and pastor starts talking about age differences and i'm about to hear i'm like i'm getting ready because he's gonna say like you gotta watch out for him because you know you're used to that you're like <laughs> it's gonna come against us and all of a sudden he drops the he goes no the older man needs to watch out for the younger one because they usually the ones that do something and leave and i was like oh okay well that's a twist but you know what <laughs> at the end of the day we weren't going to let anything stop us because I think God was ordaining it already. Yeah. And you could yeah. you could tell how God was working in it and how God was working, not just in this, but in each one of us. Yeah. Because he was like challenging us and, and making us face hard realities and how we act, how we walk. And I think those were the biggest challenges because when you're looking at an age difference too, there is. Because I can't go into dad mode. You know, I can't just be like, well, you know, this is like my daughter's would be a daughter's age. And it's like no dad modes. You got to let them live. You've got to let them experience life and walk their walk so they can come to an understanding on their own. Mm -hmm. And praise God, I had the experiences I had where I knew I could, I wasn't coming in to fix anyone. Right. If anyone was going to do the fixing, it would be Christ. And mm -hmm. so that was some challenges up front as oh, well. Yeah. And then also the challenge of, you know, like if I'm getting irritated with him, it's not because he's old and like, you know, but because I get irritated at people, like I just fight irritation, <laughs> you know? And so, so it's like, Sometimes the enemy, the flesh, people, society, what you've watched, what you've heard before, the stereotypes you live with, like there's fears that can creep in, but it's just you're trading one set of fears for another set, mm. depending on who you're married to. Mm. And that and, and, and it comes with anything. Any like any any difference you have with your spouse has the potential to be exploited against you, but also it has the potential to be redeemed for you, depending on you know, what voices you're letting in. And right. so yeah. it's always felt very natural, more natural than with anybody else. Through those obstacles that come with age differences, you know, they feel the least. And mostly it's like our literal issues with our own personal sins that yeah. that drive right. the biggest challenges in our marriage. Mm. Once you guys were, were finally married, obviously there was a little bit of a wait time and <laughs> Maybe a, a more of a desire from one end to get married quicker, you know. Um, but once you guys were married, talk to us about, um, and, and let's talk specifics here so that people can get practicals. But what are some of the things that you guys were, um, how can we say this? Some of the good things. You get married, obviously you have a honeymoon stage and all of that. But talk to us about that before we get into the other stuff. <laughs> um, what were some of the things that really blessed you as you guys got married and finally were able to be together in that way? Lots of blessings. Um, you've done it one way, mm -hmm. and now you're doing it a different way. Mm -hmm. And you can see how that works when two people are not idolizing one another, but they're actually putting Christ on that pedestal and putting Christ on his throne where he belongs. And so you would see even it now is a little, you know, it's far better now, but mm -hmm. when we had difficulties, you could see where we would turn you like, you know, you kind of get away from each other because it's the way it is. And then you saw two people reaching out to God and saying, Hey, you know, and then watching it, bring it back together in a, in a whole new way mm -hmm. than I've ever seen it. It, you know, it wasn't just like, okay, whatever, let's get over it. It was like, no, it's we need to get in and fix this. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that I would say for me was was exciting and like, wow, you know, and there was difficulties. You know, we'll get to that. But the, the exciting part is I had a, a person who was seeking Christ, mm -hmm. a, a wife, a spouse, someone who wasn't just turning to me for everything and expecting me to be everything, but laying that burden on the cross. And, and that gave me relief. And that's how, if you would say starting out, that was that was huge for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it felt like there was a safe place to mess up because he wasn't going to leave me. And from the beginning, we were like, divorce isn't an option. The end. That's it. We don't need to bring that up anymore. There's no little asterisk. There's no small, tiny print. It's like, that's literally not what we're going to do. God hates divorce. Yes, you've had it happen. Both of us have parents that experience it, but like, we're not going to keep this going. We're not going to keep that pattern going. And so knowing that if I messed up, if I wasn't on my A game today, most likely he'd be praying for me even if I bugged him, even if I offended him, like eventually he would be snapped back into prayer and grace mode and that um, he was rooting for me, um, that he was bringing me to the Lord mm. in prayer. And then someone to have 
comfy fun with. You know, right. it's like, yeah, it's fun to get dressed up and go somewhere, but like, it's so fulfilling to also discover in one another, like, wait, you like to just lay around and <laughs> eat this and just listen to the rain? Like, what? You know, and just like relax. Popcorn snuggle and listen popcorn to the rain. Popcorn snuggle and like, you're like, just chill yeah. and not be on and someone who you can like, I don't know, nerd out to. And another thing that comes later that you, you might not, I mean, I didn't enjoy it much up front, but like someone you can take correction from because you trust mm. them. Like so much times like you don't know me or you want to call out their sin back, but then you learn like, okay, we both have sin. That's fine. Like tell me the truth. And you hear the truth and they're not leaving and they're, and they're praying for you about it, but you know they're right. You know they've seen all of you and they still love you and they still choose you every day. And that's what Jesus does. That's what, And that's why marriage is so fun because it's like there's all these good secrets between us, mm-hmm. things that we don't even think of secrets. It's just you'd never share it with no one else because there's no reason to, yet they know it. And it just brings you closer instead of sending them away. And I always call her my ride and die anyway. Yeah. I know that. <laughs> using I say that term, ride or rapture. I stole it. Ride or rapture, she said. <laughs> I say ride or die, but ride or rapture is good too. <laughs> Now, guys, talk to us about the the, the other end, yeah. right? Um, obviously, again, now we have a little bit of context yeah. as to where you guys were coming from and a little bit even a glimpse of some of the struggles. But uh, again, let's talk some specifics here. What were some of the things that you guys could pinpoint specifically that as you came into this marriage, you begin to struggle with or some of those things that God began to rise up in you that was already there, you know, but now it just began to get exposed. And uh, Shay, we'll start with you. What did that look like for you? <laughs> so one of the things that I was used to was anger um, and how I responded in, in situations because um, it's baggage is, is weird. You know, you, you come into it and it's like, I don't want that baggage anymore. I want to be someone different, but it's hard sometimes to get through it. Um, it's it's a process. It's, it's it's the sanctification process. And you're learning daily, daily. It's like, and, and so immediately it's like something goes wrong and it's puff up, you know, ah, and it's, it's like, wait, why, what, what am I doing here? Mm-hmm. Like, hold on a second. But then that's what's cool with the word of God being in play. Cause we're right now, watch this. We, our marriage started with ministry. So we're not just learning each other. We're learning how to walk through ministry too, which is kind of cool because then you're being constantly bombarded by the word of God. Mm-hmm. So so you're constantly in the word, you're around the word, you're you're forcing yourself obediently to go to places, even though sometimes you, you're struggling with that anger, that rage, that 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 disconnection with one another. But it's like we have to go. You know, it's like this is what God has called us to do. And so if you get there and it's like you hear the word and then you're this is conviction. And you're like, I don't want to be this way. So mine, a lot of mine was the anger and learning how to to dial that and turn that into, into something else because the Bible is very specific on that. The Bible is telling me that I have to look at her without spot, without wrinkle, that I have to look at her like Christ looks at the church. And, and I have to look at her like she's redeemed and that she's she's perf- perfected already because that's what he's calling us to do as, as husbands in the house. And so I remember that going through my, my head all the time. It was like, Dah! and then he'd be like... <laughs> What's wrong with you? And, I, and, and see, he gives me hard correction. And, and I really believe that. I believe that God always has given me hard correction. I need it. I'm kind of hard-headed. So it's like, oh, he p- pounds it into me. But it's but I think up front, that was mine, was anger. And I think, yeah, that, that would, that would think that's mm-hmm. one I struggle with the most. Mm-hmm. So that if I'm pinpointing just one, and I don't want to go too more on that because there's a lot there, but anger drove a lot of me, which mm-hmm. ended up being pain, ended mm-hmm. up being sadness, ended up being hurt. So it was a reaction. And so then learning how to dig into that mm-hmm. was where I was in my biggest struggle, yeah. finding and pinpointing exactly what I was feeling so that my outward manifestation of, of, that, of that feeling could be changed mm-hmm. and we could work on that feeling. Yeah. yeah. And Michelle, bef- before you share yours, but what, what was your reaction or how were you feeling in that time as this is coming out yeah. and maybe you didn't see it before, uh, now in marriage seeing it, how was that for you from your end? Yeah. So there were all these layers. I think one, I had refused. So I also deal with anger, but I also deal with pride. So, I mean, we both do, but yeah. my pride would keep my anger publicly in check. So if I was angry at you in public, I would hide it. No one, like, to the best of my ability. I didn't want the world to know my business, but you'd know at home. If I was mad at my parents or someone, like, I would let them know later, but I would never make a scene. Whereas he's always been more, like, on his sleeve. So, like, if he's upset, 
um, one of the things that he has always done well is instead of staying in it and camping out and letting the it explode, gets up and leaves because he doesn't want to say the wrong thing or, you know, whatever. Me, that's like mortifying because I'm like, the whole world just saw you get up from this. Table. Maybe no one noticed, but to me, the person who's always so prideful, like I look together and I'm still trying to get through that. I'm like, everyone just saw my husband just jump up from the table and, and like get away. They know I said something wrong, you know? And so things like that, that's one level that used to impact me a lot is like this level of like mortification. But then when it was happening in private, feeling like a failure, mm -hmm. which is another thing like, it doesn't make him the bad guy to be upset about something I legitimately did wrong. Now at the same time, could he take it Absolutely. too far? Like I did something this big and he's exploding about like, yeah, it can go both ways. Like we're both guilty of mm -hmm. different things, different times. But I would feel, I would instantly internalize it so deep and go back to failure mode. I'm such a failure. I'm such a loser. I'm such a terrible wife. I can't get anything right. I, he doesn't deserve me. Why did he ever marry me? I'm, I'm just burdening him. You know, I would go into this dark, dark place because it felt like, you know, a coal mine that says, you know, we've been 90 days without injury in the coal mine, you know, and then someone gets this, like gets hurt right. and then it's back to zero. For some reason, it felt to me like it was my job to keep our marriage fight free for X number of days. Now that of course puts me in the seat of God in one way, demands perfection of me in another way, absolves him of all fault in another way, which isn't good for either of us, you know, like all these different levels. But because I dealt with anger, I also said from the jump that I was not going to be the screaming type because I could be. I had been to my parents in the past, like I did not want that to carry in my marriage. I wanted that to end with my teenage years. And so what I realized is that when I deny myself rage, all I can do is cry. And it, re and it revealed to me that my anger comes when I'm hurt, when I'm scared. Mm. And the anger bulks up to defend me and keep me feeling safe and in control. And like I'm in the right when maybe I am the one that was wronged, or, but most of the time I had a part in it. And so the tears actually helped deactivate some arguments, but also I had to come to terms with the humility and the humbling that comes with not rearing up in pride to defend myself, but instead swallow the parts I am guilty for and pray for the parts I feel he's maybe mistaken about. And also rather than constantly pointing out his flaws and explaining to him mm -hmm. lovingly that, you know, that's what's wrong with you, get it together, I'm gonna pray for you, but instead go to the Lord and pray for what I always say is a double heart issue. Part of it is how I react in sin to the sin against me, and part is the sin against me. Mm. And so going to the Lord and saying, Lord, work in my heart so that even if this does happen to me, I reflect it and respond like you. And then for him, Lord, work in him to whatever degree you see fit and really leaving all heart change up to him rather than it being on me to manipulate or argue or justify or bring receipts to try and change someone that honestly, my love changes him more than my anger. My anger keeps him the same. My frustration keeps him the same because we're both flawed. And so it's been a roller coaster ride of all this anger and all these feelings, but but you start navigating it when you realize it, you're in it together. Right. Well, let's turn the tables around. Mm -hmm. um, for you, Michelle, mm -hmm. you know, what were some of those things that you begin to notice start to come out yeah. as, uh, as you got into this uh, covenant in marriage? Irritation, frustration, annoyance. And I used to call them by those names because I didn't know what else to call them. I was always that way with my parents. And I, it got worse as I got older. I'm, I'm quick in how I think, and it doesn't, I'm not saying I'm smart, it's just my brain's always going like a hamster, like, you know, and so I'm always thinking and I'm always like having 50 thoughts at once and it's overwhelming. And so because of that, you know, anytime it took someone a pause to think, which is actually the responsible thing to do to take a second to think, and maybe like I say, some people are crock pots, some people are microwaves, some people, they're really baking on this thought and some they got a thought every second and neither's better or worse. They just have their own time. But if I encountered crock pots too much, I didn't want to have anything, like I was just frustrated. You're slowing me down, you're whatever. Very prideful again, very me oriented. So then I come into marriage, not wanting this to carry again from my childhood and before I had the Lord carry into my marriage. 
And at first you've got honeymoon stage, you're still trying to please the other one, you know, you haven't come up against a lot of challenge yet. And then all of a sudden I find myself getting frustrated at him and nitpicky with him and irritated with him and all these things. That has carried on this whole marriage. And it, it got worse when you add in an amazing blessing of a child, but still a child that needs your attention. And when you add in ministries and when you add in grown up life, right? Where it's like, okay, now we're married. We're the adults in the room. There's a little child watching how we behave. Like it just got more extreme, intense and more common. And then it was only a few months ago this year that I was finally at a place. God's worked on other roots and things that He needs to uproot in my heart. And so it finally came where we're driving in the car, and He just is telling me, you know, your irritation impacts me and our daughter. And in that moment, do I want to hear that? No. Am I thinking thoughts of like trying to defend myself? Of course. But I'm also far enough along where I know you're supposed to lean into conviction and you're supposed to mm. lean into truth even if it offends you. And even if it makes you feel for a second like a failure, because, hey, you are failing in this area, Michelle, you know, and so, but it's not up to you to fix, like you have God and God can help you. And so in that moment, I turned to my phone and I, because I'm a Googler for better or for worse. And so I'm like looking up, you know, like the Christian, I don't know, like Christian thoughts on irritation. And the very first thing I found after I prayed and, and Googled was this really amazing article that links those all to selfishness. And when that when that clicked in my head, because in our early arguments, he used to say I was being selfish. And in some ways, it's like, I can't help but make like add myself into the mix when we're having an argument, you know, and bring myself in. And I don't necessarily think that's selfish. That's like trying to relate and understand. But at the same time, I was selfish, more selfish than I thought I was. I thought I was pretty generous. And in some ways I am, but that doesn't mean I'm fully good in that area. Like, we were uncovering selfishness together, like him realizing it and tell, and not being afraid to tell me, me creating a culture where he doesn't have to be afraid to tell me. It goes both ways again. And so once I was able to call a spade a spade to say, okay, it is actually selfishness in my life that's causing this problem. Because anytime someone delays my gratification for a goal or a deadline or something I want, anytime someone's interrupting my flow, I'm rearing up and being ugly and causing myself to stumble. It's no one else's responsibility, it's my own. So that's a big one um, from my side. Talk to us about the overcoming, right? Um, the beautiful thing about you guys is that you do have Jesus in your marriage. And so talk to us briefly about how the Lord helped you overcome in your marriage to bring you together, to figure it out and understand. I take it all the way back to the Word. The importance of it. I think that there's no temptation out there that the Word of God doesn't handle. And I think, no, I don't think, I know. I, I, these think statements sometimes get us in trouble because I have to know this. I have to know that when I face trials and tests within our, within our marriage or whatever it is, but mostly right now we're talking marriage, so within our marriage, that I need to be steeped in the Word of God. And I need to be steeped in prayer. And I need to be steeped in this knowledge that, you know what, we have Christ who redeems things, who has redeemed. I, I can't look at her as someone being redeemed. She has been redeemed. And when I think of this in, in, in thoughts, it's like, you know, I sought out the Lord and, and I asked him to help me keep his commandments. We're talking in Psalms. But, but then what's really cool about that is, is I have the word of God on my heart. When I have that word inside of me, when, when it comes against me, well, then there's something always there to battle it. There's always something there to, it's my fortification, it's my castle, it's my moats, it's my, it's my parapets, it's everything that I have, it's my whole arsenal, it's my armor of God, because that is where my mind has to be in this. You know, she's talking about irritation, she's talking about, you know, one funny thing about that is, is you know what, when they stop being irritated and you're still irritated and you're trying to blame irritation, your irritation on them, well, now you got something to work on because that's where we were. It was like, I, I'm irritated. And then now she starts working on it. I'm like, well, I'm still irritated. Hold on a second. So, something's got to change. <laughs> and again, we take it to the Word of God because we, at the end of the day, this, this is a partnership that God has ordained. This is something that God has put in before the beginning, of, that be, before we were even formed in a womb. He was like, one day Michelle and Cher are going to be here together. And you know what? They're a couple that are going to be focused on me. They're going to be seeking me and they're going to need help. And you know what? I am that help. And our prayer or my prayer is, Lord, help me daily to see her the way that God sees her, 
to see her the way that, that he, and, and love her the way that he loves her. Because you know what, as a man, I, I, the only love I knew before all of this, before Christ, and before, it was a perverted institution of love. It was like this weird thing in my mind that if I got these certain things and they, and they were mine, then I'm okay. And then when you don't get those things, it's like, eh, the love turns off, because, but that's not where love turns off. Not when you're created, not when you're with God, and not when you're a child of God. Love doesn't stop at no. Love doesn't stop at no sex. Love doesn't stop at, 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 at an argument. Love continues forward in this. Um, I remember, like in that, because we had a time in our in our in our pregnancy where after pregnancy where we couldn't even be together for months. But you know what? God was like, "You're okay," and it wasn't like the, I remember in my past. It would be like, "I ain't getting none." What? No. But God learns and teaches us how to carry this love. Mm-hmm. And when I can love her this way, then I'm doing what God wants me to do. I'm obeying His commandments. I'm listening, mm-hmm. and I'm saying, "You know what? I'm putting myself aside." And that is one of the hardest things, especially in prideful and people, is, is putting yourself to the side and saying, you know what, she comes first. Now in that irritation thing, yeah, it was got to a point, and but it was prayerful. It was always prayerful, and I'm always praying, like God, how can I broach the breach the subject, right? And when I started seeing it impacting our child, I was like, this is time. Right. When it was me, I'll get through it. I'll work through it. I can do it. But when it becomes our child and we're, that's who we're there to protect, mm-hmm. then we have to start stepping up the game. And where did we do that? By turning to the Word of God together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's very true. Amen. Now, guys, both of you uh, shared individually the coming of your daughter, you know, becoming parents, which obviously it's a blessing, but God uses that. You know, we know that He uses that to continue to teach us how to come together. So for you guys individually, um, and we'll start with you, Michelle. Talk to us about that, about you getting pregnant, having your daughter. What was that like for you? Take us through it, and, and how did it impact you and bless you? Man, I think just relying on God so much. I don't think I've prayed. I didn't pray as much as I started praying when I got pregnant. Uh, now it's it's much more common, but I was praying a lot. And, you know, on a note, Shay, in his previous marriage, they had had a lot of miscarriages. And so one thing I was praying is, Lord, please, like, even if there's a lot to learn in that painful experience and he can he can bless it and redeem it despite all of the tragedy. However, I was like, please let us have at least one so he doesn't have to go through that again, you know? And, and so there was that pressure. but. In the midst of that, so much reliance on him that goes into every other area of your life. You realize you're relying on him a lot here, and it's making you walk through it different. And so you start to bring him in everywhere else. And that's really when my worldview shifted to be truly like biblical. And I started thinking about everything and how the Bible impacts every area of life. You know, as we were trying to do home birth, that's a whole other thing. But it ended up being a three day attempt at home birth, three days in labor. And Shay was, you know, of course, Jesus is our rock, but Jesus was using Shay as my physical rock, the one I was literally hanging off of as I'm in contractions, the one who's there because the midwife policy was until you're a certain amount dilated, which I never dilated that far. Um, They weren't going to stay full time. They would just stop in to check on you. But our pregnancy and our labor was a little different. And so... That was bonding, you know, and just relying so much on the Lord there. And then and then she's born, and it's just suddenly, I remember sitting there when we brought her home. The first time I was alone with her, and I'm holding her, and I just start crying because I realized, like, I'm the end of the line. Like, everyone else can tap out, and I still got beer. I'm the one with the, with the milk. I'm the one that she's going to want, like, the snuggles. And as beautiful as that was, it was also terrifying. But through this whole thing, each and every phase of her life and our relationship as mother and daughter, I'm seeing more of like my relationship with the Lord and how I'm mirroring that, how Shay's mirroring that. It's just another way where you start realizing before maybe you could make decisions apart and not, and you'd still feel united. You have a little life that you brought in together and you're both equally invested in. And you realize it's another dying to self where it's like now we're making even more decisions that have to be together. You don't realize how much you still had independent thoughts from one another until there's a life where you have to commit to make 
the decision together. And there's been times where I'm like, we're do like, this is what's going to happen. He's like, really? Like, we have not discussed that at all. Even if I agree, like, it'd be nice to be looped in. And I'm like, you're so right. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, but it's a whole, it's a whole other level. But it, it just brings you deeper into, into relationship with the Lord, honestly, when you lean on him for everything and through all the fear and all the laughter that comes with being a parent. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> She's amazing. <laughs> Shay, talk to us about your side, right? I mean, obviously, you're not carrying the child in your belly, but you're there. This is your child. Your this is just as much as your child, and you're feeling and experiencing everything at the same time. But from your perspective, what was that like? Beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, First up front, because, you know, you get to you get in a pattern again, baggage, miscarriages. You're always like, okay, well, you've come to a point in life where it's like, if it does, it does, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And so I was like, just rolling with it. So I was actually pretty chill. Um, I remember that she would, she was all worked up about how to raise a child, how to do this, how to do that. And I'm like, every day it was a different way. Yeah. Like every day she's, cause I mean, let me tell y'all out there in the world. And if you've been pregnant and you've had a baby or if you haven't, let me just warn you here. The ones who have, you know, this, there's a hundred thousand different ways to do one thing and everybody has their opinion. And so I got to a point where I was just like, I looked at her and I said, you know what? I'm going Yahweh. I've got God. I'm done. I said, <laughs> I said, I'm going to just trust in God. I don't need to hear no more. When that baby comes, we're going to take care of it. I did pay a lot of attention, though. I was always like in the birthing classes and all those things, very active. It was very important to me, especially when we got past the, the, the point where I had gone before. I said, okay, this is serious. You know, this is really happening and I need to be available. And I, and I love that. And I loved knowing that I had a child coming in. And then when I held my child, It's like, wow, this is number nine, number 10, I think, yeah, 10. And I'm like, wow, I'm holding number 10. How God, and I'm looking at God the whole time, like, God, like, I didn't deserve this. Like, I know my life. I know my past. I know what I've done. And he's like, well, that's not what this is about. This is, I'm redeeming. I'm, I'm doing some things in this. Hmm. And so we had this beautiful child. And, and you know what? It really opened me up to, which is sad in some ways and good in other ways, but I've come up with, I'm firm with her, but I have a lot of grace with her. But what that's teaching me is I need to be firm, but have a lot of grace for my wife. And why that doesn't transition the same way, you know, she's a little tougher, like like more irritated. And I'm like more chill with Kalia. And it's kind of amazing. And I'm like, okay. But then I start thinking, I'm like, wait, how can I use this? Because this is my home. It teaches me a lot of things. When we look at, when I look at home, I look at umbrellas and I look at how God is the man and the wife and then the child and look at all of these protective measures for that child. And if, I, if, if I'm not showing the same, like if I'm not under God being in that walk with God and with Christ and saying, hey, I need to be more Christ following and, and treat her as the church, my wife, then my daughter starts to see something different. And so it's a challenge. It actually challenged my heart mm -hmm. to start to even change more um, how I respond to Michelle, how I act with Michelle, where to act with Michelle. You know, we can't, it's no longer just like, uh, 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 or, you know, any disagreement. You Sometimes you have to hold your tongue. And, and, and then in that holding of the tongue, it actually helps later on in the mm -hmm. discussion. So you're learning as you go. And I'm, I'm telling you, this is a struggle. I know I've been talking this whole time and, and being very boisterous and how we're supposed to love, and, but it's not the easiest thing in the world. But you know what? We have God. And so putting that whole thing together in this, in this beautiful family, it's like, wow. And so now we even have more responsibility to protect her, to raise her up in the Lord, to raise her up in, 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 in Christian morals. And watch this. It puts us under the light, too. What are we doing in our day to day? How are we responding to one another? And you can definitely see it when you have a bad response. Your child picks that thing up like a tape recorder. Mm -hmm. It's like, all of a sudden, it's like, uh, and you're like, oh, where'd you get that? Oh, snap. Never That's mind. Amazing. Never mind. And then you have to work it back out of them. And you don't want to be, we're all going to be hypocritical in ways, but we don't want our child to sit, sit there and see us as always being hypocritical. Wait, you're telling me this, but I'm watching this action. And so it really challenged us to come together and, and really work it as far as being mother and father. And then also wife and husband. It's huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things I realized was that so much of the Christian walk can end up being behavior modification. Mm. And I garden a lot now. And so I've gotten to know plants more than I ever thought I would. And there are plants with such deep roots in the ground. And when you go to weed, if you're just like, I don't feel like doing all the stuff with all the right tools, I'm going to just pull it up. And you pull and the root don't come out. 
the stalk and all the leaves and all the mess, it comes out. Maybe you've delayed it going to seed so that it makes more of the plant, but the roots are still in there. And you're like, well, maybe it'll just die because it's not getting sunshine or nothing. Some do, but most of the ones you don't want, they live easier than the ones you do want. Like the one you do want, if you break off its stem, it dies. The thing you don't want, you break off its stem, five more sprout up. <laughs> and it's because you didn't go after the root. And so that's behavior modification. Now there is something to say about you can grow through behavior modification, but if that's all you ever camp out at, then the anger, the irritation, all this stuff, you're just suppressing it and pretending it's not there, but it's still growing. All of a sudden it explodes and now you don't know how to deal with it. And with a kid, rather than raise her to act right, but have the wrong heart, we've really focused on, and it's impacted how I just live and how I engage with scripture is how do I show her the heart of God and, and show her the fruit that comes of, from loving God rather than don't do that, it's sin. Don't do that, it's bad. Stay away from that. Be scared of that. Avoid that. Like there's, there is time for that. Like don't touch the, the burning hot pan, right? There, there's time for that. But trying to show her the love of God, how do you do that? You don't sit there and say, well, these are the fruits of the Spirit at the end. <laughs> That's also important that they know the fruits of the Spirit. But like, what are those? What does it feel like to experience those? And how she's going to learn is by us letting God work through us so that she knows what a family looks like and how it feels to be around people who let the fruit of the Spirit be and let God work. And when we're, you know, going through stuff, apologizing, I've gotten so much better at apologizing. I literally own it as soon as I realize that even if I don't want to say it, even if I feel like I was in the lesser wrong, I say, I'm sorry for that thing that I said, or I'm sorry for being disrespectful. I'm mm -hmm. sorry that was selfish. That was self-centered of me. And I do it for our daughter and for, for Shay, because there's no point, like we need to forgive quickly. We need to apply grace quickly mm -hmm. and exercise that muscle, right? Like if something's flying at your face, bat it away. Okay, can you be faster at giving grace than even as ducking something flying to hit you in the face, you mm -hmm. know? And, and that's that's been a huge game changer yeah. in our life. Hmm. Now guys, for, for people who are watching uh, your testimony right now, as you're sharing together, maybe they're thinking about marriage. Maybe they're in that place right now, actively, where you guys were at some point looking at that person and thinking, oh man, I think this is the one. I think this might be it. What's a word of encouragement, um, a word of advice that you can give to that person right now who is thinking about marriage? And we'll start with you, Shay. I want to give the standard answer, e equally yoked. But we're not going to have the perfect marriage. We're not going to have the perfect, like, we're all in a sanctification process. But I, I think what I would say for me is what I was looking for was somebody who had a desire for Christ. Not just shows up to church, doesn't just show up to a Bible study every once in a while, but somebody who you can actively see seeking the kingdom, seeking his throne, seeking his throne of grace, where, where everything is built. And so I say that's that's mine. If you're looking at someone right now, and not judgmental in like, well, they do this wrong and this wrong. No, you're not counting. But does someone have a genuine desire? <laughs> when they mess up, is there a genuine like desire? Like, oh, wait, oh, I shouldn't have done that. You know, that's what I would be looking for. Because it's hard to say that I'm going to take somebody and change somebody because we don't change anybody. Yeah. Only God can do that. But if you're doing that, really wait and wait on that person and see where they're going and, and see if that's really what it's going to be. And that's what I saw in Michelle. I saw somebody not perfect. I wasn't perfect. But man, she, she had this heart to just dig in and, and be in the Word and just chase after Jesus. And I was like, you know what? That's going to help us get through a lot. Mm. That's good. Preach it. <laughs> no, uh, I think I would say... Marriage is very rarely, if ever, the solution. It's actually the beginning mm. of a beautiful puzzle. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people look at marriage like it's going to solve their problems. It's mm. going to solve their problem with lust. They won't have to watch porn anymore. It's going to solve their loneliness because now there's someone around. It's going to solve their rejection is issues because they've been accepted by somebody. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to. But often, because this is one of the most beautiful gifts that we are given. Now, salvation is number one. And if, if you never get married, he's still going to work in you. 
He still has a plan for you. Amen. He still has sanctification for you. He'll use other magnificent and miraculous ways to change you to become more like Him. Not getting married is not an excuse not to grow in Christ, but if He chooses you for marriage, He has planned that there's going to be one specific person that is designed and made to sharpen you and you them. And it's not, it's not that you're the knife sharpener, you're another knife and you're both dull and you're both being sharpened. And that's a puzzle, not a problem. It's a puzzle because mm. there's a solution and God has the solution and there's a big picture and you know what it is. It's to become more like Christ. And it's not frustrating every day, but sometimes it is. But you know that it has a solution and you're working towards it each day together. And it's this beautiful thing because you have the ability to be loved by someone no matter what. You're getting to see a glimpse of how much you're going to be loved for all of eternity by Jesus, how you already are loved for all of eternity by Jesus, who no matter what He sees you doing, He still loves you. And that doesn't change. We get to see that with this person, that no matter what goes wrong, they're loving us more each day because they're becoming more like Christ each day. And so that's what I would say is shift the mind. Like the finish line is not saying I do. It's the start of a marathon. Right. And you, just like in a marathon, you have to keep saying at each mile, you're going to keep running because you could give up and go home and not take the medal. But you can also keep running knowing that it's going to, it has its end. It's not forever but that there's victory in that. And I think that that's what I wanted to leave people with. Mm. Now, for those who are, who are watching and are contemplating divorce at this time, and Shay, we'll start with you. And what's a word of encouragement, a word of advice that you can give to that man or woman um, that is currently thinking, man, I, I don't think I can continue. I think uh, this is over. And obviously it'll it depends on the situation and all of that, right? But what's a word of encouragement or advice that you can give to that person? So I'm going to base off her analogy a little bit on the running the marathon. When you run a marathon, now some people have their little fanny packs, but back in the day, you run, there's a little drink station that you run through and they give you the drink and you resupply, right? I would think of that drink station as Christ. As Jesus. See, a lot of things, a lot of couples, no, it's hard. It's tough. Oh, divorce is tough. And if there's anyone sitting here right now looking in this camera and, and speaking about how tough it is, I can tell you that mine was a death because it was unexpected. It was all of a sudden it was gone. But in this marriage, see that what I did in the last marriage was I supplied my own sustenance. I supplied my own water. I supply, I hear that. I, I, I. I know it's hard to say this, but stop putting all of your focus there right now. Stop putting it into like, what am I going to do next? How am I going to do this? Where am I going to go? How am I going to step out? And just come over to this side for a minute, especially if you're a believer. If you're an unbeliever, look, let me tell you something. Christ makes a difference. But if you're a believer, relationship with Christ is what is going to bring fountains of living water. So you focus on your relationship in Christ. We want to focus here so bad in the world. because, it, But let me, and another thing, it's temporary, by the way. It's fading. It's going away. But he has a way of making that going away and fading beautiful and colorful. So we sit here and we think about our relationship and focus there. That's, that's what I'm going to say. Divorce, I would remove it from you, strike it from your mouth, except for, like you said, the, the, the certain situations. You know, I, there, there's times, and even that, I know that we have people that we counsel now that are going through it. They're having a hard time that maybe their, their, their spouse is not the best they're not beating, they're not trying to kill them, they're not trying to do all those things, but they're not walking right, they're not doing the right thing. But the last word on my mouth, even for them, is even though that's the Bible says, yeah, if you know you cheat on your wife, well, I'm saying, let's just pause for a moment. Let's just pause for a moment. Let's put that divorce word out of our mouth. Don't let that be the first thing. Let Jesus be the first thing in your mouth. He will guide you where you need to go, and he will put you in the exact position where he needs you to be, and we got to believe and trust in that. Yeah, on that note, I think that from what I read in the comments, I read a lot of comments under a lot of videos, under a lot of reels and posts about all kinds of things. And the comments always seem to be full of people who are praying that they're the exception that gets to do it. <laughs> and maybe that's you and maybe that's not you. But if the first word out of your mouth when you hear us say, don't give up, is the word but, then I'm just going to ask you, to take a step back just like Shay did and 
pray for yourself and pray for your spouse. Mm. It's the, it's not just praying. It's the most powerful thing mm. we have in our arsenal yeah. is to bring God in and submit to Him. And I can't guarantee any kind of outcome. I don't know. I'm not God. It's above my pay grade. But I can say that rather than saying, but you don't know my husband, but you don't know what I've gone through, but what about when? But, but, but. But what about God? Over and over in mm. Scripture, but God. I have <laughs> heard some of the most amazing, miraculous stories, oh, and He nice. loves you enough to make you one. You don't have to say, well, but those miracles aren't for me. But victory isn't for our marriage. But healing isn't for my spouse. But, but, but. You don't have to be a victim of buts. Mm. You have God, and He will work when you pray for yourself to be more like Him and for your spouse to be more like Him. And I can't say what it's going to manifest into, but I can say that but God is a very powerful statement. And if the least you can do is just Google but God and read every time he's ever had that in his word and see what kind of things came from that, then that's one of the most powerful things you can do today for your marriage. Shay, Michelle, any last words for people who are watching uh, your testimony right now? And we'll start with you, Shay. I'm not the best. I'm not even the greatest but I'm better off because I have Christ. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an honor to be here yes. to discuss our marriage, our beautifully imperfect marriage that is only worth discussing because of what Jesus has done in it. And like when we shared our individuals, we're here not to say, hey, look at us, we've got it all figured mm. out, but to say, please let this inspire you. Lord, please inspire and encourage and convict and challenge people watching and let something that you've done in our lives be what blesses them today because that is the hope we have every time we share anything about our life. And I think that marriages will only go so deep on our own. But when you put Christ into it, he takes it to a depth that we don't even understand. I don't understand it. I don't understand how much more I can be in love with this woman, except for that Christ came into the picture. And so out there, whether you're thinking of getting married or, or you're married, I'm going to keep saying Christ over and over and over and over again because He is the first fruit. And without that fruit, there's no sustenance. There's no satisfaction in this. You can think it there is, but I mean, there's always something. But the depth that I feel with this woman isn't because she's so cool and she understands me and she gets me, which is all true, but it's because we have Christ-centered hearts and He drives this marriage. And that's where we want to be. And that's where we think that all of y'all should be. Shay, Michelle, could you guys just pray for those um, who are watching right now? Could you just pray for their marriage mm. um, as we wrap up? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that opportunity. Lord, right now we just pray. We're, we're, we're on our knees because we know that prayer is activism. And Lord, we know that the mar there's marriages out there that are hurting. There's marriages out there that are broken. There's marriages out there that are beautiful, that are flourishing. And Lord, we just want hearts and minds in those marriages to be focused on you, that they would read the Word of God together. They would be in the Word of God together. They would study the Word of God together. They would pray together. They would seek you together. They would listen to what God has to say. Have hearts that receive conviction. Have hearts that receive correction. And let us let us, all of us, all of us married, all of us that are seeking marriage, have hearts that are serving hearts. The greatest position a man can hold, Lord, is a servant, and you showed that through your son, Jesus Christ, how he came to serve. He came to serve. He didn't come to condemn. And so, Lord, as we walk forward in our marriages, as we walk forward seeking you, dying to self, picking up our cross and following you, that we would learn how to be that kind of servant, not the ones that point fingers and condemn, Lord, but the ones who turn to you and turn back to their spouse with grace and mercy and forgiveness and love. 
all of the attributes that you give us. And sometimes that requires correction, Lord. Let us be hearers of correction. When my wife speaks correction to me, Lord, let me be a hearer of that correction. And when I speak correction to her, let her hear that correction because we know that we're driven by God and we're being prayerful about it. And when we bring it up, it's not just because we're mad or we're angry. It's because we have listened to you because we paused. We prayed and we proceeded in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, everybody. I hope the new testimony has blessed you, has encouraged you. Just wanted to let you know that if you are in need of help, that we have people that are ready to speak with you. So down in the description box below, in the comment section, uh, if you're watching from YouTube, if you're listening from our podcast, just look for the link that says, talk to someone who cares. Click on that, fill out the form, and somebody will get in contact with you locally. Now, this is only available to people in the U.S. right now, but we are working to get resources for our international viewers and listeners. But for right now, if you are in the U.S. and you need help, you need to talk with somebody, please fill out that form and somebody will reach out to you. God bless you, and we'll see you on the next testimony.